Welcome to Nature's Guardians. I'm Micah Siegel. Each week, I talk with people working to save and help animals around the world. They're nature's guardians, and you can become one too. Today, I'm talking with Liz Holtz at World Animal Protection. Welcome to the show, Liz. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, great to have you too. To start, tell me about your background and how you got where you are now. My name is Liz Cabrera Holtz, and I'm the Senior Campaigns Manager at World Animal Protection, which is an international animal protection organization that protects animals um, used in farming and wild animals. And I started uh, by going to law school because I wanted to help animals. So I got a law degree about uh, 12 years ago. And ever since I've been working for organizations that protect animals. So you got a law degree that because you knew that you wanted to help animals? Yeah, so I, I grew up, I always knew I loved animals. I worked for a veterinary clinic in high school, but I also knew that um, math and science, I was better at reading and research and writing. So instead of going to veterinary school, I decided to go to law school to see if I could help um, either with lawsuits or legislation or working on policies that help protect animals. What do you do at World Animal Protection? I oversee um, our campaigns that protect animals and we have two, two different campaign tracks. We protect farmed animals, so like cows and pigs and chickens that are used for food. And we also protect wild animals, both protecting their habitats in the wild. But more often, most of my work focuses on wild animals who have been, are being held and exploited or hurt in captivity. Can you tell us anything about the organization? So World Animal Protection has been around for more than 70 years, um, but for many years, the organization was focused on directly helping animals, animals impacted by disasters um, primarily. And then more recently, the organization's transitioned to what we call systems change work, which is a fancy way of saying we're trying to change the systems that hurt animals. So instead of just helping the animals at the at the very end, we're trying to change the way these systems work so we don't have animals who are in these bad situations. Can you describe the work? Well, I can tell you about some of our campaigns. Um, so my work most recently has focused on wild animals who are exploited as pets. People who want to treat wild animals the same way we treat cats and dogs. But cats and dogs, you know, can be happy in our homes, but a monkey and a lion, uh, those animals don't belong in human homes. So we work to pass laws that protect animals from being in those situations. We work on education to educate people about why wild animals shouldn't be in homes. And then we also work by pressuring the pet store industry, which sells so many of these animals to stop selling them. How big of a problem is this? Uh, Wild animals who are sold as pets is a very big problem in the U.S. So when you look at the wildlife trade generally, we're talking about millions of animals, millions of wild animals every single year who are um, either captured from the wild or they're bred in cruel operations, which in the U.S. we call the mills, similar to like puppy mills, and then other countries use the term wildlife farming. And then they're sold into this worldwide multi-billion dollar trade for use as um, quote unquote pets, um, food or entertainment. I would say the pet industry is is one of the biggest commercial exploiters of wild animals. And what does your company do to stop that problem? We target the pet industry directly to expose their role in um, the breeding of these animals and mills and how those animals suffer and even die sometimes before they're sold to people and we mobilize people to pressure these companies to stop engaging in that in that kind of business. We also work with legislators We and, and ask our supporters to contact their legislators to pass stronger laws. And finally, we educate and tell the stories of animals already suffering in this industry um, to try to change people's behaviors. Which animals are most frequently sold as pets? Um, I think when it comes to numbers, there's, it's also very difficult to get data, but looking at numbers and the numbers of animals dying to get there, I would say fishes are some of the most exploited animals. Um, 
But then the common animals are um, like the reptiles and amphibians you see sold at big box pet stores like PetSmart and Petco. So those animals would be um, small aquatic turtles, bearded dragons, geckos. Then you have birds like parakeets and then um, small mammals, guinea pigs, hamsters, chinchillas. So the, those are the species I work on most frequently. Is it illegal to own those animals? Generally, the, all the animals I just named, it's not illegal to own them um, or to possess them rather, but some states, we sort of have a patchwork of laws and regulations. So for example, red-eared sliders, species of turtle, and they're actually native to parts of the U.S., but they're also considered an invasive species because when they're released in different parts of the U.S., they can kind of take over native populations of turtles and take over their breeding ground and take their food, which negatively impacts endangered or threatened turtle species. So some states have actually banned their sale. So in those states like Massachusetts, you can't sell a red-eared slider, um, but in other states, PetSmart and Petco and other pet stores and other online stores continue to sell them. What do you know about the demand for these animals? Fortunately, there is considerable demand. Um, and for some of these species, the problem is getting worse. We know that the number of what the pet industry calls quote unquote specialty pets, so that usually means non-cats and dogs, increased 26% between 2011 and 2016. Um, and reptile possession is also increasing. And the last figure I've seen, I believe is 2016 with an estimated 6 million reptiles living in human homes. And that's a serious problem because these animals are not designed to live in human homes and they're not, that's not where they thrive. You know, they live in vast open spaces in the wild. What about parrots? Parrots, I don't have, I don't know how many parrots um, are in the U.S. in human homes, so that's a really big problem because parrots are really difficult to keep happy in human homes. They're deaf, you know, they live in these huge flocks in the wild. I'm increasingly seeing stories about people because a lot of um, older people, like people 50s, 60s, 70s, have parrots, and as they die, parrots, some parrots have really long lifespans. So in the coming years, there's going to be a, a serious influx of parrots that shelters and sanctuaries aren't going to be able. We've worked with a sanctuary in Rhode Island called Foster Parrots that does really great work and they're overwhelmed with the number of parrots who, who need care. I have a parrot. You have a parrot? <laughs> yeah. He's really happy. I know, I know that because he doesn't pluck his feathers. Yeah, self-plucking is, um, is, is one sign that parrots are in distress. Yeah. What's his name? Fruity. Fruity. He likes to eat absolutely everything. So do my dogs. <laughs> yeah, a lot of pets do. So if you had your wish, what would it be? Well, my wish for animals, that would be every animal would be in a habitat and a place or family where they can fully thrive um, and where their interests are more important than um, people who want to uh, make money off of them. So we, we put those interests over that. Do you think there's an appropriate way to run this industry or do you think it should just be eliminated entirely? We're advocating for it to be shut down entirely. Um, yeah, if you check out our website, we're one thing that I think sets World Animal Protection apart is we don't support what some groups called sustainable use. So sustainable use is the idea of um, using a certain number or using animals in a certain way that doesn't impact the overall population. You know, like with endangered animals um, or threatened animals, obviously, you know, very few people would support taking any number of endangered animals, but we don't take that approach. We want to see wild animals um, living in their natural habitats. So that does make us, that does make us different from some organizations. What are you doing to reduce demand? As I just mentioned, demand is increasing in for some of these species. Um, and one thing we do is we have some resources um, for teachers um, that we're hoping to expand, um, explaining, you know, why wild animals belong in their natural habitats. There's something called behavior change, which is like a scientific approach to changing people's behaviors. Um, and we're not, I'm not an environmental psychologist, but that's something we've been looking into a lot, seeing how to educate people why 
one, why animals, certain animals don't thrive in human homes, but also to think about ways we can engage with animals differently. So, you know, visiting animals in a sanctuary or visiting animals at a wildlife refuge, or even just enjoying the animals, um, like the native animals who live in your community. Um, Cause I think lots of us or people my age <laughs> who are much older than you grew up thinking about wild animals in a different way you know, about how accessible they should be or how easy it should be to see them. So we're kind of trying to change that narrative um, and change the way we think about how we should be in relationship to them. So let's switch and talk about farm animals. What is your organization doing about farm animals? So we have um, uh, also a double approach to farm animals. So one, we work on the policy side. We'd like to see um, the, an end to the expansion or um, creation of new factory farms. And those are large, it sounds like you're familiar with factory farms. Those are really, really, really big buildings that house you know, thousands or tens of thousands of animals. And then on the other side of that, we also um, do a lot of work around plant-based eating. So encouraging people to um, either adopt a plant-based diet or just incorporate more plant-based choices um, into their daily diet. And we do that by providing resources uh, and holding events, like we're about to hold a food truck event in New York City. And that will include the component of, you know, the actual food truck to tell, you know, give people tasty food that's plant-based. Do you know anything about Humane Certified? I'm not familiar. I'm not extremely familiar with the different programs. We don't support various certifications because we found generally they either either don't either the requirements are not at a level that we think would be acceptable for any animal or alternatively they're just not enforced so that's like something people use they hear the word cage free um, and they think that that means something that it doesn't it's really confusing for people all these different labels so we take a non-judgmental open approach um, you know we welcome anyone of any diet, we want to encourage them to, you know, adopt plant-based choices, but we don't, instead of going that route, we just encourage people to adopt plant-based or incorporate more plant-based choices into their diet. So is most of your work on the demand side? That's a good question. No, I would say it's actually a good mix because um, in terms of supply, we are, we directly lobby corporations and venues that have wild animals. Certainly on the wildlife side, most of it actually is on the supply side, but then on farming, um, yes, we do a fair, it's probably 50-50 on demand to talk about people's diets and, and individual choices they can make. So let's switch and talk about wild animals in the wild. What does your group do for them? So we support um, laws and policies that would um, strengthen protections for habitats, but that's not, that's certainly not a major focus. Of the thing I said at the beginning, our focus is animals already in captivity. But um, one thing that we get asked sometimes is, you know, what's the best way to support endangered animals? And absolutely the best way to support the most endangered animals is to support the protection of their habitat because they need, you know, a safe place to live that will give them everything they need. Um, so we support like in the U.S. laws that, that strengthen those protection or rather we protect also attacks on those laws. And then another um, element is that we do a lot of work educating people on the link between wild, protecting wild animals and factory farming. So we have an office in Brazil that focuses on destruction of the Amazon for food production. Which countries are you most active in? So we have 13 country offices and that means that they're, um, we have people like me who are staffed full time, you know, and live in country and work on the policies there. And the countries that I work most closely with are Canada and I, I work with the UK. Um, because we also face similar policy issues and um, these countries, these Western countries like the US and Canada and UK, you know, we're the ones who are sort of demanding these animals. It's the people who live in our countries that are demanding these animals from other countries. Um, but we have, you know, people working in South Africa and Thailand and Australia and New Zealand and China. So our work is, is all over. Where does your organization get most of its money? We get our money from um, individuals primarily, and then we also get um, funding from foundations. But, but a lot of our development work is, is just from individuals, so, so connecting with individuals who care about animals. We don't receive any money from the government. So it sounds like most of your work is on policy. 
Well, a lot of my work is on policy because I, probably because I'm a lawyer and that interests me and that's where some of my strengths are. On my team, we have someone who specializes in corporate engagement and that's um, a term for just meaning like they work with companies like travel companies who want to adopt policies where they make sure that no one using their company will like go to a, a place that hurts animals, for example, you know, like goes to a, a place where elephants are forced to perform in shows, for example. And she also works with companies who probably don't want to work with us, but we're trying to pressure them to change. And then we also have someone who we call a community engagement um, manager who works with volunteers and, you know, works with people on plant-based eating initiatives. So we do a lot, but I'm definitely the, I'm more of a policy person. Can you give us an example of a couple of projects that have worked really well? Um, sure. So I think we had, uh, we did a food truck in DC that was really great. Um, we had lots and lots of people come try plant-based chicken sandwich. And I think that's an example of, of, you know, a smaller local impact, but um, changing people's minds about what plant-based foods might look like. Um, on a more broader scale, last year we ran a national campaign um, asking people to go to their local PetSmart stores and asking them to adopt a policy against selling animals and instead transition to um, like adopt, don't shop, if you've heard that phrase. I would call that a success because we got um, a lot of participation um, and we had, you know, a, a lot of good conversations with people um, who are in, working in the industry. Uh, and then a big success in this field generally is the Big Cat Public Safety Act passed last year. I don't know if you heard about that, but that was the federal law that banned the private possession of big cats. So it's no longer legal to um, have a, a lion or a tiger in your backyard, which probably should have been, a, you know, which should have been illegal many years ago. What do you think about those exotic cats like savannah cats? Uh, as part of our, our belief that wild animals belong in their wild home, we don't support breeding of, of wild animals for, except in extremely limited circumstances, you know, if it was done by like a conservation center for, you know, for those animals to be released for endangered animals. But other than that, we don't support captive breeding um, or like uh, if you've heard hybrids, you know, people breed hybrids of different, of wild animals. So that that's not something we support. Has your group had any failures yet? And what have you learned from those? Sure, I think any group Every group on the planet has had failures or, or setbacks. I think anyone would say differently was not being completely honest. When you work on what we've what you've called the demand side, when you work on trying to change people's minds about something, that's just really difficult and you don't know the best approach when you start. So one thing we've struggled with is getting the word out about um, you know, why we think wild animals should just stay in their habitats. And I think one thing we've learned is that the best way to to educate people is by working in partnership with people, working in partnership with like local rescues and sanctuaries, working with people who already live in the community as opposed to us just coming in, people who don't know us and just us telling them what to think. Um, that's, I don't think that's uh, usually a good strategy. And what do you wish will happen for wild animals in the next 30 years? That's a great question. In the next 30 years, I hope every wild animal is living. They're living in the wild, they're living free, and they're not being disturbed by humans. Pets are prisoners just like kids. What are the top five species that you wish people would not get as pets? I'll say reptiles and amphibians are particularly not good choices for kids because not only are the there are issues with providing them, you know, with a habitat where they can thrive, but they can also be really dangerous, especially for little kids because they carry salmonella. So that's why actually the CDC explicitly says that children under five should not be in homes with reptiles and amphibians. Hamsters are also really tough because they're so delicate. Um, they're also unfortunately popular with children, but it can be difficult to uh, handle them in a way that's not frightening or a way that won't hurt them. So while, again, we have the message of we want all these animals in their native habitats, those three species come to mind. And then I suppose I'll add primates. Um, that's less likely, but um, even my children who are three, <laughs> I have three-year-old twins have said, oh, they want a monkey. So I think there's just something children just see, see those animals and are, are just are just drawn to them. Um, but obviously, you know, a monkey is not a good, good choice for a human home.
Do you know how many people have monkeys as pets? That's a question I've been asked multiple times by journalists. There's no data because in the states, and it is still legal in, in some states to possess non-human primates, the estimate we've, we use that we think is much at the number, we think the number is actually quite higher, but we say maybe 15,000 people at least still have those animals in their homes. Um, and you, if you Google it or you have a Google alert, you'll be shocked to see how many news stories there are constantly of these animals escaping or biting or injuring someone. So it's definitely happening. It's just kind of happening in the shadows. What about big cats? First of all, it's now illegal, though they, the law says that if you already had a big cat, you were allowed to still keep them, but you have to register um, with uh, Fish and Wildlife. So people, people really don't know in terms of like, I've heard estimates that there's maybe 5,000 big cats like in facilities here. So that includes facilities like, um, like roadside zoos, but also human homes. I really couldn't, I would guess the number is not quite high for actual homes because you can imagine how difficult it would be to have a lion. Um, but unfortunately there still are some. What would you say to kids who have some of these pets and how can they take better care of them? That's a great question. I think if you already have a wild animal, we just encourage you to do two things. One, to do lots and lots of research so you can make um, the habitat as great as possible for them. And again, we do support adoption. So we do understand, you know, there are millions of animals already impacted by this and they, they can do well in human homes. We just, you know, prefer the wild. So understanding that these animals will continue to be here for the next um, few decades so they can provide them what they need and give them veterinary care. And then two um, is to have a plan for what happens if something happens to your family or you think you, you know, you won't be able to take care of them anymore. Because unfortunately, lots of families um, or not families, but lots of people might abandon them outdoors because they think they'll survive there, but they don't. Either those animals will, will die quickly or unfortunately, or not unfortunately, unfortunately, but some animals, as I said, with the red-eared sliders, they'll actually kind of become invasive and take over. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching. You can help animals by hitting the like button and subscribing to this channel. I'll see you next time on Nature's Guardians. Bye.